It's Foos Talk Live. You talking to me? Compelling and lively banter. Are you going to talk to us? Talking foosball. Foosball was how I measured my value as a man. You took that away. Players and fans, promoters and pros, unedited and raw. Talk, talk, talk. Living in the moment. We have a lot of important things to talk about. All while practicing social distancing. Cool. We'll talk. No big whoop. Let's get this thing started. Foos Talk Live. Coming to you live from the studios of Foosball Radio and Inside Foos TV, it's the 45th episode of Foos Talk Live, to uh, brought to you in part by 518 Prints, one of the best printers of promotional items, T-shirts, jackets, hoodies, and foosball apparel. Visit 518prints.com today. Brought to you in part by Foosballers the Movie. Download your copy of this Joe Hessling, a documentary at foosballersthemovie.com. Also, Foos Talk Live, brought to you in part by Foosball Clubs USA, promoting foosball through the school systems all over the country. Visit foosballclubsusa.com and make a donation today. And also brought to you by United States Table Soccer Organization, the USTSO, helping to usher in a new era of competitive foosball. Become a member and register at usafoosball.com. Hey there, I'm Tom Robinson. Thanks for joining us once again as we uh, spend another Sunday evening together discussing the beautiful game, foosball. And of course, conversation is uh, always a whole lot more interesting if you have someone else to share it with. From the, uh, the from the great state of Colorado, high in the mountains, let's welcome my co-host and the best foosball play-by-play announcer in history. It's Jim Stevens. Wow, that's quite a compliment. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Tom Robinson. <laughs> Show number 45. How about that? 45. Um, 45. 45 years ago, our guest tonight, special guest tonight, was voted the uh, Tournament Soccer Professionalism Award back in 1976. Ooh, How about that? 45 wow. years ago. 45th show for us tonight. And I think it's going to be a good one. Um, our special guest tonight, of course, one of the legendary figures. In fact, maybe the first legendary figure in the history of foosball, a man that was voted the player of the 70s. He was part of that initial class of Hall of Famers in 1986. So really looking forward to talking a little foosball. Well, a great foosball storyteller here tonight. Looking forward to that. And, you know, we always have to have our, our third wheel here, of course, uh, our second co-host, an all-round all foosball fanatic here to balance <laughs> the universe. He's a whole lot faster tonight. It's Mark Torres. Hello, Mark. Bumblebee, 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 bumblebee. You know, I have a range. It's probably three octaves long. Yeah. Three octaves. I yeah, I could shatter glass and simultaneously uh, impregnate a woman who's uh, ovulating. <laughs> oh, it's no, crazy. No, just, that, just it's with the too singing. early. Just, Come on, just with the voice, just with the singing. <laughs> yeah, I think I have. I can go at least three octaves myself. I can go from Barry White to the Bee Gees, as they used to say. Oh, mm. there you go. Yeah, anytime, um, some late night no. in some town somewhere in the world, you and I are going at it. Oh, I was just going to say time. that. We'll we'll have to get that one on tape for sure. That's that's going to be a battle. That oh, would there's, be. There's, yeah, we'll find a karaoke bar and just go head to head and uh, figure that one out, dude. I'll figure come, it out. I got one I'll, question I'll for Mark Torres, real quick. Uh, Mark, have you eaten recently? Ah, uh, <laughs> call me out. If you're friends with me on Facebook, you know that on Monday at 6 p.m. I stopped eating entirely, just water. Oh. And then uh, my wife added potassium, magnesium, and sodium to my water on the fourth day. And then on the fifth day Ooh. at 6.05, I had spinach. Because I had no nice. food. In that my was the first food days. you had was spinach? Spinach with garlic. And um, yeah, spinach with garlic was the first. And, and uh, so I used to, I've done three day fast before and I've talked about it on the show. And I, we're going to talk to Bauer soon. I've, I've never done a five day fast. And let me tell you what, man, if you've ever <laughs> dropped acid, okay, if you've ever <laughs> dropped acid, then you know, if you'd fast, like uh, no, by day on. three, day four, you're like, Oh, I'm tripping out, man. I can't pull over any further. I'm already pulled over. I can't pull over any further. Wow. Uh, and then, like, but you know, it's trippy too. I, I, I didn't have any hunger pains. My wife started, my wife did it for 60 hours. So she went two and a half days. Um, it's good for, it's, if the science on it is great, it's, it's an amazing cleanse. And uh, I would recommend it if, unless you have pre existing conditions um, like comorbidities or diabetes or anything like mm. that, you look at the research. I recommend everybody should do a three day fast. I th I'm sorry, Mark. I think we need to check the stats on that. Clay, is that is that a correct stat? I I wasn't listening to be honest. <laughs> when Mark calls, I have this thing that happens in my head. Yeah, that no, just kind of. You know what occurred to me though? I, you know, for anyone who's ever seen the movie The Exorcist back in the seventies, you know, having spinach after five days, perhaps we saw a bit of that. Yes. Um, you that's know, right. After after dinner that night. <laughs> 
Um, oh, so yeah. imagine oh, if the exorcist of, it was on, was held upside down. How about that? Anyway, keep going. What? <laughs> weird. So weird. Speaking of flashbacks, so we're going to have one of those tonight as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we apologize in advance if you're having dinner while listening to this podcast, where we, we do greatly uh, appreciate your patience in that or, regard. Or, bre or breakfast in Hong Kong. Yeah, anyway, right. It's here. Yeah. Yeah, hey, absolutely. hey, guys, before we before we really sink our teeth into what should be a, a great show, a couple of things on the docket. Uh, <laughs> on the docket tonight um you know, and i'm sure you guys have agreed you guys have all had some great messages about about this podcast about this show and the response has really been really cool to to hear from from players who have been playing for 50 years in some cases and from yes. players who are just beginning to play um everyone seems to appreciate what we're doing here focusing on the history predominantly over the last couple of months and as we move forward of course we'll get more current with our our news but it's really been tremendous response to this and i think we can all be pretty proud of what we're doing here oh it's it's uh it's an absolute thing that i i would say if you talk to my wife she's like why are you so like you know anxious on dinner on sunday night you just want to get dinner out of the way and, and run out of the room what's what's the deal <laughs> like well uh, you know I, I can't you know disappoint i gotta go do this it's gonna be great we're gonna have another great show all right okay have fun you know it's that 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 uh, kind of like a when I was a kid, you know, I was, I was 10 years old having dinner in the summer and I wanted to go out and, and uh, you know, I was begging my parents to let me, you yeah. know, get off the table so I can go, you know, hang out with my buds, you know, it's this, that's the same mm -hmm. feeling. I just gotta, gotta be here. And it's, uh, wow. You know, I got a message on my, uh, Twitter that said, Mark, you're brilliant. You're amazing. I'm your biggest fan. And I said, you know what, mom, you really need to stop harassing me <laughs> on my Twitter. But then, you know what, you guys, I woke up because I don't even have a Twitter. So I'm just trying to participate right now. <laughs> That's my whole story. Wow. Yeah, not a bad yeah. one. <sighs> not a bad one. Man. A couple other news stories this week. You know, it's been not a lot of news going on over the last year for sure. Right. But we did get the uh, the cancellation of the Las Vegas tournament in April, mm. the Hall of Fame Classic. Not going to happen for a second straight year. And my, my first thought when I heard that, uh, one was it you know disappointing that we wouldn't be able to get back out there that soon, but understandable. Yeah, that's frustrating. But also, three individuals who were um, announced as Hall of Famers last year expected to be able to be recognized in a ceremony in Las Vegas, um, you know, at the Golden Nugget last April, and then again this year, not being able to be recognized. And we're talking about, of course, Charles McIntosh, Christina Fuchs, and Tom mm -hmm. Yorn. So I think, as we did last year, we kind of focused on it here at Inside Foos TV, had interviews with all three of them and all of that. You can find those at Inside Foos TV on YouTube. Um, but kind of disappointing, I know, for all of them that they won't have a chance again to be part of that very prestigious uh, ceremony there in Las Vegas. Mm, disappointing. Disappointing, to say the least. Well, I mean, it's it, we just have to be safe about this, plain and simple. <clears throat> There's that that is uh, that's the plain plain truth, and of course, it has a lot to do with, of course, um, Las Vegas. I mean, now is Vegas open at all? I mean, are they? Is there anything going on there currently? I think Vegas I is open. They are, I believe. Is it? I think they yeah. are. I think they are with narrow restrictions, but I could be wrong. I could have but not completely fabricated that whole thing. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for. Uh, but but also, you know, the, the cancellation of one tournament uh, also led to the uh, the announcement that the, the nationals this year, at the end of June, would be held in Denver, Colorado. Uh huh. Uh, just the other side of a couple of mountain ranges from me, and that's going to be at the nice. end of June uh, there. The IFP National Championships. Clay, did you did you have something to say about Las Vegas? Uh, probably, it's but Clay, I can't probably. get a word in it. Why it's here? So it's just, I don't know. So I'm probably just gonna unplug my mic and think for the rest of, oh, the, rest of the show. Oh, now, now. <clears throat> no, I don't know. I had a really funny joke, but I'll save it for next time. <laughs> Be spontaneous. Let it go. Again. Let it go. <laughs> I don't know. I just I have tunnel vision right now. Oh. Uh, oh. Not, that was really inside. That was a really nobody, inside inside nobody joke. Nobody gets that joke, but you no. guys and I love yeah. it. Thank God. <laughs> Good Lord. Don't get them started. You I'm do telling you, don't get them right? started. Mm -hmm. Man. Get this show running. Yes, running. sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, if I vanish from the show, I had some food like 20 minutes ago. I'm just going to put tunnel vision in the just chat. Just pull a Tom <laughs> Yor. Pull a Tom <laughs> Yor. All right. Just go sit on the toilet and do the show from there. Be polite. Oh. 
Oh, man. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <laughs> as, we, as we segue away from that, uh, yeah. a reminder that uh, next week we're going to be talking with uh, the great Dave Currington, Hall Dave of Famer. Dave Currington, yeah. The, uh, the second golden era of foosball, uh, the Tornado Tour. He ran Tornado for a, a couple, maybe three decades. So looking forward to that. And the week after that, we have uh, the great Tony Bacon schedule. So some great guests coming up on Poos Talk Live the next couple of weeks. Right. No, it's uh, I think the, you know, tonight and next week and the week after are all going to be stellar. There's no question about that when it comes to our guests. We're just uh, we're hitting uh, a triple, shall we say, uh, in the next three weeks. So really digging that. And uh, oh, incidentally, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out here to uh, our compatriots in Florida states. Uh, they are playing foosball this weekend, by the way. And uh, there's some, there's some, uh, some really interesting results. i got to say, Sammy Dijon from the 518 is making us proud. I just had to mention mm. that. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, tearing up some pros down there, it looks like. Saw a couple of matches. Well, it's about time. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's about time. Um, of course, Sam, a, a great young player. And so it's really going to be a lot of fun to follow his career. Uh, moving forward to see the, the things that he can accomplish. And he's already accomplished so much, maybe the most accomplished player, certainly since Billy Pappas of mm -hmm. that age. So who ironically, uh, to, ironically, yeah. Billy showed up and yes. he's sitting at third in open doubles. He didn't play singles or he'd probably be sitting at third there as well. He beat Tony and Bud Spriedemann to get to third and then lost to Terry Rue and Paul Smith, I think at the winner's bracket, but uh, interesting. Don't, Tony, I mean, Billy comes out of nowhere, and I've been watching him play a little bit. He's the guy's just a lethal weapon, man. He's just so good. It's scary. Yeah, right. Who's Billy so. playing with uh, in doubles? Scott, uh, Scott O'Hare. And Scott O'Hare's playing O'Hare. goalie for him. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. No kidding. Scott, wow. a big, big yeah. pull shot. A really, really a great pull shot for Scott O'Hare, no doubt. Well, uh, you're, and you're, that's you're, in um, his uh, jurisdiction. So uh, rumor has it, if you if you beat him, he actually just arrests you right there on the spot. <laughs> <Yeah>. Ah, <laughs> yeah. that's, there you that's, go. That's, that's what I would do. It'd be that's worth five, spending the night in jail. Five foosball uh, of law enforcement officers. That's, that's going to be a good one in the there's future. A, like there's like the top five, right? Top five law enforcement yeah. officers who play foosball. Yeah. Did you say number, the top five? Number one through four the would be Biney, and then Scott O'Hare would probably <laughs> hit number five. Don't forget. Hey, about what about Cindy the top Dan? five? Uh, the top five ex cons. Oh, yeah. And there you put go. those two lists in a, in a bracket and have them play it out. I know at least two. Yeah. I know at least one right now here on the show. I know, I know, I know three. I know three, and two of them are Hall of Famers. Ooh, yeah. There you go. That, was a, that was a very creative insult, Mark. I appreciate it. Highly creative. Highly creative. Give me time. Give me time. <laughs> you know, with all this Before levity, on. <laughs> with all this levity about uh, fasting yeah. and and food, I think it's better that we just uh, get into our social lubricant of the week. <laughs> Well, what Jim and I like to do right about this time is to reveal uh, our favorite IPA. And of course, Jim, you've, you've got the honors here. What uh, What is it, pray tell, you are drinking this evening? Well, you know, I live in the state of Colorado. Mike Bowers, a great player that we're going to be talking to tonight, our special guest from the state of Colorado. So I kind of stayed in state for this one. Okay. Uh, from the Great Divide Brewery in, uh, in Denver. Uh, I'm drinking the Titan IPA. Uh, and of course, Mike Bowers is really a titan of the sport. Uh, 7.1 percent alcohol Ooh. to crisp boldly hopped american india pale ale notes of pine and citrus are complemented by hints of stone fruit while hop flavor aroma and bitterness are balanced by a supportive malt backbone well, they, how about they, that they better be balanced well, let's have a sip oh that's delicious oh that As is they the always stuff. seem to be another mm. colorado ipa Where? down the hatch mm -hmm. Nicely done. Very good. Bye bye. Well, we've got, uh, I'm going to the mountains as well. Uh, although these are the Adirondack Mountains, uh, this is a brewery I've, I've sampled the before. Hills yes, the hills. Yeah, the hills. <laughs> the uh, mole hills. Uh, Adirondack Mountains, it's called Adirondack Brewery. Uh, this is their Lake George IPA Wave 16. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we've got lots of, um, uh, there's a, a hints of pine and citrus. And something they refer to as hops. Gee, it has hops too. Okay, let's try that. Let's see what we've got. Mm -mm. Oh, I'm being carried away by wave 16. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark. What is the post-fast drink? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
filtered water from the refrigerator. Hopefully my filter is clean. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, it's hopefully. bacterial in nature. <laughs> and uh, if history is a guide since yesterday, I may be cutting out of the show and muting myself for the next five minutes after I drink some of it. Nice. So, bottoms up. Woo-hoo, cheers. <laughs> and, and Clay, what, pray tell, what are you what are you consuming in liquid form? I'm, got, I'm scared to answer. Uh, I've got, I'm going twin engine as usual. I got the normal bottle of water, which is uh, Aquafina this week, and then I got a different soft drink than normal. I have uh, twin engine from uh, where is this from? Actually, the from New Orleans, I think. Oh, good old Barks root beer. Barks Ooh. Barks Ooh. is good actually. That's a that's a nice brew. Very Dude, nice Dr. Brew. Pepper, Dr. Pepper didn't call you back. You're like, screw these guys. I'm going to Barks next week. Okay. Show me the money. I don't even have to like it. I'll, well, I'll just drink it. Just without further me. ado, gents, let's hold our uh, drinks in the air and, and uh, toast our honor group of the week. And our honor group of the week, of course, has to be uh, Denver, Denver Foosball. Yep, Denver Foosball, the site of the 1974 Foosball World Cup. Uh, here's the Denver Foosball. Cheers. I also want to add my intestines and my colon. To this yeah. Cheers. Week. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, baby. Good job. All right. Soon to be a semicolon. All right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Den- Denver, of course, has such a tradition of foosball. You know, when we, I think we did our top five states um, earlier in the year or last yes. year, and I think Colorado might have come out on top of a couple of lists. Mm-hmm. And uh, just a tremendous yeah. tradition, a history of foosball here in, in Colorado and in the Denver area in particular. No, and Mike Bowers, by the way, was the first world champion from the Colorado area. Is that correct? Well, and we'll talk about this with him, I'm sure, tonight. 1974, really the first major event ever held anywhere, um, was at a place called Elitch Gardens, which mm. still exists there in Denver, although in a different location, actually. Um, but uh, it was held there. It was a $50,000 tournament in 1974 called the International and it uh and mike's going to talk a lot about it he always does it's always a great story to hear about the early days of foosball and of oh, course yeah. he ended up winning open singles as documented in the movie foosballers uh got to tell his dad etc and so we'll talk i'm sure a lot about um, that event in 1974 at elish gardens with the great mike bowers here tonight absolutely looking forward to this is going to be so fantastic so let's uh on on the the spirit of that and the theme of that let's uh, let's re- revisit let's go back with the flashback with great moments in foosball history. This is a Foos Talk Live flashback. And Mike Bowers comes out of the bullpen, moving to the forward position. Scotty Weidman has maybe shot 10 to 15% of this whole match. Why not bring Bowers out of the bullpen? Well, they've got a two game lead and a one goal lead here for the match. So Mike Bowers setting it up in full position, looking for the championship. Bowers strokes the wall. Mike Bowers playing goalie all weekend long. Comes out of the goalie position, moves to the forward position, strokes the long full shot on Dana Marr. Mike Bowers and Scotty Wyman in a bit of an unexpected result win the Open Doubles title here at the 1998 Masters. And a tremendous defensive performance by both goalies. The last-minute pairing of those two uh, was kind of a surprise. But, you know, Mike Powers never lost his composure, and he stepped up defensively all weekend. So you got to credit that man right there. Veteran Mike Powers, the first Hall of Famer to ever win a title on the Pro Tour after being elected. And look at that. He is an extraordinarily happy man. And Scotty Wyman happy as well, winning a championship from the forward position. A that tremendous was, uh, performance by both these individuals. That was kind of icing on the cake there. Mike can shut people down all weekend, then he comes up and shoots the match point. Didn't that something? Listen in next time for another great moment in foosball history. It's Foos Talk Live. Wow, that sounds like quite a quite an event there. So, so uh, Jim, what was uh, what was exactly happening? Uh, with, were there uh, a lot of accolades once that uh, that was finished? Oh yeah. Yeah, he was surrounded after the match by by players who just felt so good about that. You know, at the time, Mike Bowers was the oldest open champion in history. I believe he was 47 years old. Wow. Now, of course, Todd Lafredo has gone on and, and broken that record multiple times over. But at the time, 47 was old. That was really old right. for a football player. There used to be an event called 35 and over, which we called dinosaur doubles because it was all about <laughs> all the old guys. Now 35 is pretty young, in fact, the, the youngest members of the United States World Cup team are around that age. In fact, exactly that age. But uh, but it was a really a great event. A guy that really didn't play a lot for 10 or 15 years came back out on tour and played with Scotty Weidman, played goalie all weekend, was amazing. 
defensively and then got to put on that final point. But what a great know, weekend that was. You know what, guys? 98 was still very, very impressive volume of foosball players. Mm-hmm. There's still five tour events. And not only that, he had a phenom in front of him. He had Fernando Fernando Rosa at the time. He changed his name later. Fernando Rosa and Dana Mar playing hot. Fernando's the young gun. And as these things go, Scotty and Mike Bowers absolutely outplayed them. Fernando, uh, as he can do sometimes, can make some interesting decisions in finals matches. And he, if he, he was told that if he would have shot his rollover, he might have had a chance. But shooting his pull shot, Mike Bowers has seen as much as many pull shots as anybody and uh, put the wall up on Fernando. They traded blows back and forth. And um, Mike Bowers to get up there and hit that shot. Very rarely does the does the um, aging lion get to beat the young gun. And, yeah. and that's exactly what happened in this event. That's a that's a cool story right there. That is really awesome mm-hmm. stuff. By the way, Jim, who was your partner on that uh, that play by play? Didn't sound like Mark. Well, I, I'm sure I'm sure Those. Mark Torres recognized the voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Schlafer of Foosball Master Tour fame went on uh, what, 11 years later to create Foosball Master Tour. Um, but Phil, a, a pro player, and of course, we had Phil on the show. Yeah. So everybody kind of knows who Phil is. And he worked with me. I'm not sure he ever worked another weekend with me besides that one. Huh. Uh, but he did a great job. Phil, of course, uh, knows the game so well and has a good delivery on, on the air. Oh, yeah. Player as well. Yeah, really terrific. Awesome stuff. Well, you know, the one of the things that we've been kind of looking at this week when it comes to um, our uh, our regular feature, we've kind of gotten used to called Ask Me Anything. The response this time when it comes to people sending us questions to talk about on the air. Wow. <laughs> what was it like? 20, 25 questions? <laughs> Something like that this time? It may have been more than that. Yeah, I, I posted that yesterday on the, on the Inside Foods wow. TV Facebook group. And boy, did we have a response. And there were responses to responses. And, <laughs> and so we've narrowed it down, I believe, Tom, haven't we, to a, to a small number. And then we'll get down to yeah. number one. And that number one, of course, will win an Inside Foods TV Ooh, uh, t-shirt. The you know, it's funny. You turn Inside something Foods into TV a competition. T-shirt. And even non-competitive people will start throwing their name in the hat, and then so <laughs> put it in a put it on compet on a competitive site oh. where there's a bunch of competitors and offer them a tchotchke. We could have offered them like dried cat turd, and there would have been 35 <laughs> responses. Like they just want to battle it out. Yeah, um, let's how about go a at bowl it, of spinach with Mark Torres? Well, that's the prize: a bowl of spinach with Mark Torres. Incredible. It would have been an amazing <laughs> response in any scenario. It, it's going to always do well. Cool. Well, what do you say we play? Who's talk live? Probably presents Ask Me Anything. You can ask me anything. You have to ask me nicely. You get to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, Buck? You have some questions for me, do you? All right, well, let's get to them. Well, <laughs> as we play for the coveted Inside Foos TV t-shirt this evening for Ask Me Anything, uh, we've actually isolated this, and that was tough, to the top three. There are three really great questions we're going to field. Uh, we'll take them three, two, and then one. And of course, we'll announce the winner at that time when it comes to the T-shirt. But, and, and some of these did cross over, we have to admit. Uh, some of them were very similar, but I do have to give people credit because they really, really came up with some great, uh, great uh, questions. So I want to start with number three. So guys, here we go. This one comes from Ron Moore. Uh, should U.S. players be getting more exposure to different tables? And if so, how could that happen? What do you think? Jim? Um, You know, it, these days, when judging who the best players in the world are, it's all about multi-table. You know, when I look at uh, who I think the best player in the world is, of course, you've got your best players on the German tour. you got the best players here on, on Tornado, uh, Bonzini, et cetera. But really, as the sport grows internationally, as becomes more of, an, of, a, of, a, of a worldwide sort of sport as opposed to individual countries, being a great multi-table player is important. And a lot of the great American players who have traveled overseas have embraced that idea. Mm-hmm. You know, all of them went over in 2006 or in 2009 to the World Cup, being, of course, great players on Tornado. But in many cases, especially in 06, very inexperienced on these other tables. They just sort of had to survive, had to had to kind of get back to their their beginnings in the bar and kind of just knock it around on the opponent's table and hope to steal one, uh, you know, a goal here and there. Um, so in my opinion, it's it's really important moving forward. The oh, yeah. players do have access to these other tables, you know, one way or the other. In, in other countries, I know in Germany, in Hamburg, there is a training center. It, it's, it's a it's a local pub there right um called kicks k-i-x-x 
And in that in that bar, they have something like nine or ten different kinds of tables. That's great. Like Fifteen or twenty total tables, and they can and they can um, they can train on all these different tables and prepare. And, and part of the reason that there are so many great young German players are because they have access to other tables. Here in this country, we have uh, there's a couple individuals. I know Dan Barber in in Denver, and I think the, uh, Terry Rue down in in Louisiana. I have a number of tables. Uh, Tracy McMillan, I believe as well. Tom York. Who have access to some of the tables, but we need training centers here in this country yeah. in order to really create great multi-table players. So it, it needs to happen, and I think it will. Mark, I think uh, I guess it just depends on what your aspirations are. If you have a pretty, for lack of a better term, ethnocentric view, and you only are interested in competing here locally, and you want to be either competitive or um, successful on Tornado, then it's probably you probably shouldn't. Why should you? You should just focus on your table and get good at it. And you don't need to diversify your skill set. However, if you have broader aspirations, and I do believe this is where the sport is headed, the sport it, at the current trajectory, especially if you know what's happening internationally, the USA, uh, United States may be a little bit slower behind. Mm. Uh, you just heard Jim's uh, description of what's happening in Germany. But if you have aspirations to compete at an international level, you, there really is no choice. You better be at least balanced or near a skill level on the other equivalent tables, or you're competing for a spot to represent the U.S., and you're going to lose. And the other part of the question is, how do you do that? you got a couple of choices. One of them is you find out if any of these international tables are available to you locally. You buy one or two, which may not may be cost prohibitive, or you just keep, decide, you know what, I'm going to go to Europe once or twice this year, and I'm going to go out there and play foosball and mm -hmm. hang out and play some tournaments. Those are really your choices. If you're in that age, in that demographic of players that says, you know, I want my goal is to play at an international level, win at a World Cup. And when, it may not be in my immediate lifetime, but I do believe the foosball is going to be an Olympic sport at some point. Now's the time. Right. You might as well get exposed. You might as well find your way to getting there. Now, what, is a, what does a table manufacturer have to say about something like this? Obviously, you've got Tornado in this country, <clears throat> you know, making one of the top tables on the planet. I mean, how do they respond to something like that? I mean, it's certainly something we want to compete in a worldwide uh, scale, especially at the World Cup. Um, and Tornado is, yes, one of those tables, but there's four others. So how do we, how about uh, like an organization like USTSO, because they want to put together a club system, uh, maybe encouraging other manufacturers? I mean, how would that yeah, work? Yeah, you know, this is an interesting question. It, it's a tough one because, you know, from, from the outside in as a business person, you might think, huh. I wonder if Tornado really wants to um, narrowly um, be exclusive. Is the, you, you wonder if they'd uh, you know, have that much interest in blocking out other table manufacturers, but then you mm. think it through. And you know, Tornado is a very small percent of revenue for Valley Dynamo. Right. I don't know if Tornado really sees a pending threat. And, and it's not like Tornado's not out in, in Western Europe and otherwise trying to sell tables. They're sure. actually would be happy to sell tables in each other's markets. So um, I don't know if that helped to answer the question. I was just thinking from a business end. I don't think Tornado would like actively pursue a competitive scheming and warfare in terms of pricing and that kind of thing. Right, I think right, the, right, the market's right. too small to begin with. Okay. No, I was thinking USTSO as well because they're they're really trying to organize uh, for this country uh, more, more play in, in the club system. And maybe if clubs were included um, and the, the motivation to get more tables available in the various clubs um, in some way, shape or form, maybe making it easier to connect with tables or find used tables that uh, would be considered in the top five with the, the, the World Cup style tables. Yeah, you know, and one thing I've found, it, yeah, certainly I think that that could, could happen and, and should happen. But another thing I've found, and I, and I know we want to move on to our next topic, and I want to hear what Clay has to say about this and, yes. and you as well, Tom. Um, but I have found, you know, working so many international events that as I have, that there really is sort of a non-competitive environment between the different tables. They are they all do kind of work together. They recognize that it's important for these players to all be good on all these tables. They're very different. All the tables are very different from each other. Um, and so... For me, I think, uh, you know, yes, the club system would be good, but it, it really is. I don't think it's an issue with the a competitive issue with the different table manufacturers. Here's one last thing I have for you. You know, despite the fact that we do, we are behind the curve a little bit in this country when it comes to multi-table play, the United States has still won six of the 10 
World Cup events. Mm, interesting you say that. <laughs> Very interesting. So, okay, the future could be, well, um, it could, it seems like Europe and uh, the other parts of the world may have to uh, catch up to us then. Okay, I like yeah, that. Well, we're talking, well, you know, as we get past this, we have players that are going to very soon age out. And we have some replacements, but not a ton. Right. So we'd be the fair about what's going on. We have incredible masters, but at some point, they're just going to stop playing. And mm-hmm. I don't know who the... Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's move up forward, guys. Yeah, Get no, absolutely. Clay, Clay, anything from a st- statistician's point of view you know, with Clay and coming from the numbers side? What, what, what two you words, here? two words. Nolan Ryan. He threw a fastball. He, he could probably like throw a changeup. He could probably throw a curveball, but he beat everybody with one pitch for like 30 years. So if you're good, how many did you say? Six of the 10 uh, World Cups we won mm. playing one table? Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Just keep throwing fastballs. Okay. That'd be cool. Like it's a luxury to learn on other tables, but who cares? Ooh, there's, now there's an answer. Who cares? Hold, hold on your table and then steal yeah. one or two here on the opponent. Exactly. Yeah. And we're, and you know, our players are talented enough to do that. So eh, who cares? If they want to, fine. I support it. If not, support that too. well you know i'm, I'm just going right. to the only thing i'm going to add to this is that uh i grew up on a different table from tornado and i loved bonzini as a kid i loved it and you know there's nothing that you never take no one will ever take that away from me but i understand the appeal of tornado i get it now i know i understand and that maybe playing on other tables may be difficult but come on bonzini <laughs> it's great it's cool yeah, I That's love a whole other hour right there. there. Yeah, right. <laughs> world, world's fastest moose ball shot. Google it. There you and go. Thanks, Ron Moore, for a great question. Yep, Ron, great, great question in number three. Number two comes from Gary Sanders, and we'll split this with Gary and John O'Brien because they both act, asked basically the same question. Uh, cumulative versus match play. Is match play an antiquated, unfair method of determining winners? World Cup uses cumulative. Does the Swiss system often mentioned on the show address this? If so, how? Uh, Jim, you want to start with that one? You know, um, certainly it can. And and anybody who has listened to this show kind of knows that I'm a fan of the Swiss system. Not that I don't like double elimination. I've grown up with double elimination if I've ever grown up. Um, but it, the Swiss system, just for a variety of reasons that we've talked about, you know, in this system, you play in the morning, you, have, you play six or seven different matches, nobody goes out in two, you play a variety of level of players to, to earn your seed in the mm. elimination bracket. You know when you're going to play, you know where you're going to play, you know who you're going to play. You then get a lunch break, you get a break. And then in the afternoon, you may return and the elimination bracket uh, begins, the early rounds of the elimination bracket, and you divide that elimination bracket into basically the top 16 being pro, the next 16 being novice, the next 16 being amateur or whatever, next 16 being rookie, whatever you want to do. It could be sure. A, B, C, D. But you know when you're going to play. You know where you're going to play. You can control, really, for a, from my point of view, as, as, a, as a media producer, as a content creator, as a commentator, I love the idea of knowing that at 6 o'clock tonight, I've got, a, I've got a semifinal. At 7 mm-hmm. o'clock, I've got another semifinal. At oh, 8 yeah. o'clock, we've got the final. The crowd knows this. The, the viewing audience out there in live streaming land knows this. Uh, it's just so much cleaner and really gives you control. It, it allows you to really focus in and know that you can advertise tonight that these matches are going to take place. And so from yep. my point of view, as someone who has experienced it on the international level dozens and dozens of times, I, I love the Swiss system. And, and I think it really does, uh, is, as uh, it, it, talking about uh, addressing this to Gary Sanders, I think it really does. You know, it's a, it's a fair way of really determining who the best players are. Absolutely. I'll, I'll take two seconds on this. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the Swiss system. I think it's the future of foosball. But wouldn't it be hilarious if all you had to do was call it the American system and slap an American flag on it. And everyone was like, yeah, we got to do this. It makes sense. Oh, branding <laughs> is everything, man. Branding is everything. Let's put a gold flag on that sucker. Yeah, I like that. That's great. Yeah, but the Swiss system is the Swiss system. It isn't only used in foosball. It's used in chess. It's used in other sports as well. So it oh. isn't as if you can just change the name of something unnecessarily and make it more Oh, Jim. That is the, that is yes, the least can. American thing I've heard all day. <laughs> yes. We will change the name. It is no yes. longer the Swiss yes. system. Yes. If you want to go to Europe and call it Swiss, fine, whatever. It's American. 
That's what we are. Right. American we cheese. Are. Stand like up and recite the Pledge of Allegiance with me right now. <laughs> yeah. A Pledge of Allegiance to the system? No. Sorry. Clay, is that yeah. your answer? Is that is that the answer? Do you, you concur there that uh, it should be just America. changed? Yeah, Mer- American yeah. system. America. Glad I love Swift, too. Any, anything that, that, that eliminates, like, luck from the from the event yes it's a win in my in my book so the more matches you play a qualifying round here whatever it leads into a bracket like anything that reduces the chance that luck will prevail that's the best system there you go swiss just dominates a double bracket system period anybody who doesn't agree with that is just wrong cool that's all there is to it yeah yeah. there's some misconceptions mark right there's some misconceptions about the swiss system aren't there yeah for sure like you're going to play less matches what what um also need the myth? I don't know about yeah, that. Right, and th- that's a myth. And the other myth is that it, it could be creatively used. Promoters are afraid of it because they believe less at uh, um, less entries, less um, less um d- division types, and less entry fees. But it's just creatively managing, and so it serves that purpose. You could have other types of events that fit in line with conventional event thinking and still make money that way. You, you're not going to have forty events. It's just it's just getting out of the box a little bit and stretching the wings of the people who are in charge. That's right. All it is. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And yeah. the idea that tournaments should be supported solely on player entry fees probably is one that is needs to go by the wayside as well. Yeah, quit making sure. decisions yeah. based on money. And uh, you know, and I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll just put a capper on this one by saying that uh, if I have to compare the times that I've had the most fun. Uh, as an amateur or just regular player, uh, yeah, Swiss system or or Monster DYP, my favorite. Love it. You know, you play- ask anybody who's been to a Warrior event. Like, people don't love those for the table. I'm sorry, whoever makes the table, that's not why they love them so much. Warrior events are awesome. They're so much fun. Yeah. And guess what they use? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. Yeah, nobody goes out in two. I know that Friday Night Warrior DYP that uh, that so many players would play. You knew you were going to play five or six matches. Nobody oh, goes out in yeah. two. You're there if all not night. Seven or eight. You play all night. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yep. it's the best. And and you can add in some track players as the night goes on. So you don't have to worry about somebody showing up late, this kind of thing. It makes it huge, you know, much, much better. Well, I think we've uh, we put the end on that one. So what do you say? Now, this is our our, our winning question of the night so we had to do something special for this this is the foos talk live question of the week riddle me this riddle me this riddle me this here's the question and the question is from tyler flynn what will it take to make foosball more accessible to people who currently have no ties to the game Ooh, jim Hold on, I'm still snapping my fingers after that music. Uh, that was- I'm, look- I'm looking for a hit of ecstasy. That was like a rave, dude. <laughs> Party. I got more where that comes from. <laughs> you know, you know, one thing we saw over this past year um, in, in the COVID times, the, the, the two shows that were on ESPN, obviously Foosballers the Movie, and then the World Cup uh, from Murcia, Spain, that Joe Hesslinger produced, both of them. Um, they were on ESPN. They mm. got pretty good viewership. And of course, 97% of that viewership were non-foosball players, non-foosball fans. Yes. But I think if you package it right, and the movie, of course, was entertaining to anyone, I, I believe the World Cup show and the people I've shown it to are not foosball fans. Enjoyed it. Watched the whole thing. Loved huh. it. And not just because I was the commentator. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it has to be packaged in a way. As all these other sports are, whether it's cornhole or whether it's darts or whether it's anything else. Packaged in a way that really emphasizes the competitiveness of it, emphasizes the stories, the storylines, the drama, the individual characters involved. These all transcend individual sports, right, guys? These are these are yeah. standard stories in anything. And if these can be emphasized, if it can be made understandable, if we can use instant replay to really show what's happening, um, presented in a professional manner. You know, we've talked a, a few weeks ago about, uh, you know, at least I did, about having an arena, arena that surrounds that table number one with um, with music during timeouts and rocking yeah. the place and having a fun atmosphere surrounding it. And in the middle of it, you have this high-end professional play and there's TV monitors and there's replays and there's a PA announcer. All of this, you package it in a way that makes it entertaining to others, that it can draw them in and potentially turn them into to foosball players if they find it interesting mm-hmm. enough. Mark? Yeah, foosball. Gosh, this feels like a soapbox going on for 40 <laughs> episodes, man. So I want to keep it short and sweet. Listen, man, foosball has a lot going against it. It has a ton going against it because on its on its surface, uh, foosball, people who play foosball think 
a lot of them think that foosball is interesting to watch. It's like a narrow myopic filter. And then there's a whole bunch of foosers that think foosball is boring to watch. They don't think they, they're not even interested in watching foosball. Foosball what? on its surface is not a, an exciting, engaging sport like any other, like many, many other sports. It's just not exciting and engaging to watch to Jim's point. And, and th- think of this of any sport in very few sports. Do people actually understand the technical acumen and what is really going on? They don't know. They don't care about what's going on with the forehand or the backhand in tennis. They don't care about what, what the off- the moves the offensive lineman is doing or the def- all those things that, that the offensive lineman and defensive lineman are doing in football. They have names. There's actual technical jargon. There's technique, and the average spectator doesn't care about that. You want to know why? They're drawn to the narrative. They're drawn to the human drama, or they're drawn to the experience. They're drawn. They're drawn to the event atmosphere. And foosball is missing on its face everything that can make it exciting, and then has none of the other parts. Right. We are left. We are left with a very small part to deal with, and that is the narrative. That is the human drama. That is the stories. That is making it interesting for people to watch, and that's creating environments around foosball tournaments in terms of accessibility. That's how you got to go. You got to make it. You got to make it something a spectacle. And I'm not telling you know. There's a bunch of. I get. A, I get a, a lot of. A, I get a lot of grief for promoting trash talking. I do not promote trash talking. <laughs> but you know what I don't promote? I do not promote church. I do not promote foosball church. That's what we have. We have foosball church. Anyway, that's my whole shit. Man, Clay, you got to have something to say about this one. Let's raise the offering. I like the sound of foosball church, actually. I don't I agree. Yeah, right? but just the, like, Hallelujah. That, word, like Amen, phrase. It has, it has a nice little ring to it. Uh, I don't know. Find a way to get the kids involved. Like, uh, you know, stop catering to the, the grumpy old men with money and, and, you know, start looking to get kids involved. Because, like, you know, that's to me, well, I think it's a it's an old sport with old people. And, yeah, you know, and, you know, and we've I got myself uh, in that. the John O'Brien's of the world. Thank goodness, you know, who are doing just that, you know, making yeah. the effort to get uh, get this into schools and and community centers and, uh, and other places. It's just, you know, it's it has to have heroes for the kids to say, I want to be that person. I want to mm-hmm. be Tony Sprademan. Right. Mm-hmm. I want to be that guy. And and from the time they're able to stand at the table on a box. Like like a Sammy Dijon, they're just practicing and practicing because they want to be that guy. Now we have to present it in a way, uh, you know, for those kids who are coming up that you could be this guy. Look at the way this guy is, and I mean it's it's uh, it's it's a perception uh, when it comes to fandom, or I guess you could say just you know following your your hero. Uh, there's plenty of heroes in 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 baseball, basketball, football, golf. I mean, there's plenty of those, but foosball doesn't seem to know how to put those people out there in a way that just seems like, oh my God, these guys are amazing. And they are, but both the men and women of this uh, sport are fantastic. How do we let the world know that? And we make it clear, you know, their abilities are so above and beyond the ordinary person or ordinary player, but you could, you know, if you're, especially if you're a kid, you got a shot if you put your, put your time in here, but uh, even still, how do you make the average player or average person who's on the outside of foosball saying, hey, now that's kind of neat. What are they doing? And then take maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get into it, to watch what's going on and go, you know, that was a lot of fun. I think I'm going to watch that again. And Jim, I think to your I point. I have an idea. Two words. Nolan Ryan. If we can convince Nolan Ryan that foosball is cool <laughs> no, he, he, he's and he stops selling like Tom breakfast Robinson. sausage or whatever it is he sells, we can get him onto foosball. We're, we're in. All right, give him a call. There. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Twice, yeah. Ryan twice tonight. Um, yeah, I take that as a personal challenge as a competitor to to see what we can do moving forward um, to, to appeal to to the common man, so to speak, to yeah. raise the profile of our sport among those. And you mentioned John O'Brien as well. But they're, they're having a membership drive right now, by the way, folks. Yes. Head over to usafoosball.com to help them out, uh, raise a little money for um, a very important thing, the USTSO. Uh, as a uh, as our national federation. Okay, well, great job yeah. by by Tyler Flynn tonight. Right, Tyler Flynn. Congratulations! You are the winner of the coveted Inside Foos TV shirt, TV T shirt. Uh, by the way, uh, it was uh, designed and manufactured by one of our sponsors, Five One Eight Prints. By the way, so mm-hmm. thanks to Jesse and his great design. And of course, uh, that T shirt will be uh, coming at you soon. So, Tyler, thank you so much for your for your question tonight. Man, I can't wait to do this again. But you know. We have a lot going on tonight. So 
next thing I, I think we ought to get to here, absolutely, is, uh, is, is, is clear the way for the godfather of foosball, the player of the 70s, a person who was a star of the foosballers, the, the, the foosballers, the movie. It's uh, Mike, Mike Bowers. Mike, are you with us? Can you hear me? I can hear you clear. Welcome to okay, cool. Welcome to Food Talk Live. Yeah, glad you could make it. Hey, Bowie, good to good to hear from you, buddy. How yeah, are you? great to be here. Uh, my seventieth birthday is next month or in uh, April, so Whoa. I'm very wow. glad to be here. Happy birthday! Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Every day's a bonus, right? There you go. Yeah, man. So, uh, first of all, uh, we always have to begin with the traditions of uh, any guest of your stature on this on this uh, talk show. It's all about finding out your origins. Now, first of all, do you recall the first time you ever saw a foosball table? Where was it and what kind of table was it uh, that you were playing on? Well, <clears throat> I'd seen them in my in my early years, but I had never really played on them. And then... Really? Uh, <clears throat> so excuse me. Uh, when I was uh, when I went to college, I walked into my fraternity one night, and they were taking a vote on whether to put a foosball uh, table in the basement. A vote. A vote. You have to vote <laughs> on everything in these fraternities, right? And uh, so we, it was a unanimous vote to put a foosball table in. Nice. And it was a foosball match table. Mm. And it was the first time I'd really got on a table and played. And I got toasted by one of my fraternity brothers who had grown up in Europe and had played foosball all the time. Uh -huh. And right that instant, uh, I didn't like the balls going into my goal. I didn't <laughs> like that. <laughs> and uh, so the next thing you know, I'm playing foosball two hours a day three hours a day, four hours, six hours, eight hours, no 10 kidding. hours. And I'm, I'm just, um, I'm obsessive compulsive with it. I'm infatuated with it, with wow. this game. Okay. Now there was no tournaments. There was no promoters out there mm -hmm. throwing big, big tournaments. There was nothing. There was barely local tournaments. Huh. But somehow I still loved that game. Now, where were you going to school, by the way? What were what fraternity and what University school? University of Colorado. Gotcha. Okay. Top Kappa Epsilon fraternity. Gotcha. Got gotcha. And uh, uh, so about one week into playing, here comes uh, one of the friends, one of the fraternity brothers, and he goes, there's a foosball tournament in two weeks at, Gis in, at Giuseppe's on the hill. Mm -hmm. And I'm rapidly improving. Okay, now this is how this is how arrogant and you know stupid I was. <laughs> I was looking at winning that tournament. Nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been playing for a week. So I started playing more and more. And me and one of the other fraternity brothers goes down there, and by God, we get second. Really? We get second in the tournament. Yeah. I'm three weeks into my foosball career. How many players? And I'm going. Huh? How many players? There was there? probably about I'm going to say twenty to thirty teams. No kidding! And you came in second. Yeah, I came in second right <laughs> oh, out of the gate. Man. And uh, uh, so then a few weeks go by, they have another tournament there. This time, I think I'm going to win because I've been practicing with the guy who won, and I'm I know I'm beating him. Yeah. So geez. I show up again in uh, about three weeks, and I'm playing with my same buddy, and. We make it to the final against two Arabs, two Libyans. Really? Yeah. And this guy sets up a push kick on me, and I'd never seen a push kick in my life yet. I'm five <laughs> weeks into my career. I've never seen anyone <laughs> shoot one. <laughs> and he shoots the push kick, and it's in my goal, and I haven't budged. I haven't moved my men. <laughs> And I look at the guy that I, I'm playing with. I'm going, did, did you see which guy I hit that with? <laughs> and he goes, I, I think the first guy. The first guy. I go, I didn't move. The, the ball would have had to go right through my man. I think he hit it with the middle guy. And so we're debating it, okay? We can't see the damn ball. And then so he gets it again. Same thing happens. And he goes, oh, yeah, definitely. That thing wow. went around you. 
Okay. So <laughs> now I'm two balls into the push kick and I go, okay, I know what to do. He sets it up again. He moves. I'm out there in the long and the dink goes behind me. Oh, oh. Yeah. And I'm just going, oh. There's a little more to this than I thought there was. It's like magic. You're like, oh, my God. It went yeah. there, and now yeah. it's going there, and now what? And then now I'm going, who the hell is this guy? Where did this guy come from? And I told you, of course, Libya. Right. He's Libyan. And uh, we became fast friends, and he mentored me. Really? He essentially taught me the game of foosball. So, wow. yeah. And, I learned foosball from a Muslim. And what it, what was his and, name? Do you remember his name? It, it made me it made me a stone cold killer. Is what it made. Me. <laughs> yeah. his, and, name, his, name, so, his name was Todd Lafredo. The Muslim. His was name Todd was Lafredo. Mahmoud Drabika. Mahmoud Drabika. So, <clears throat> finally, during the course of about a year, I became a better player than he was. Really, Mike? I gotta ask goes, you, man. <laughs> Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. All right. And so he goes. Uh, he goes. But next year, he goes. My cousin is coming from Libya. He's the best foosball player in all of Libya. And I said, well, wh what's the dynamic here? How, how come, you know, where, are you, where do you guys play foosball? He goes, there's 20 foosball tables at my school. Jeez. I go, so you played at your school, your grade school. You played foosball there. He goes, yes. He goes, soccer's the number one sport when you get outside the United States and table soccer is a natural. Yeah. And so his, his cousin shows up, uh, Abdul, Abdul Braish. And they were the best doubles team in Colorado. And the next best team was this guy I played with, Tom Dreisaitz. Mm -hmm. And when it came to the Elitches tournament, which is about a couple years later, they did not play in the tournament. Really? And I said, how, come you guys, how can you guys not play in the tournament? You're the best doubles team out there. And they go, our, our leader is mom is uh Muammar Gaddafi. Oh. And if he, he's paying for our school. And if he thought that it was a frivolous game, our families would be punished in Libya. No kidding. No so kidding. We're not going to play. And oh. they would have been the number one seed from Colorado oh. in doubles. I was the number one seed in singles. And I actually think they would have won the tournament. No doubt. So, Mike, yeah. I got to ask you, dude. I got to ask you, man. Tell us, like, tell us about the rules back then. I'm so fascinated what the rules were, what you couldn't, couldn't do. Was there a gentleman's etiquette? Talk about well, how it was. There, there kind of was because you had to assume that there were rules in place because the rules consisted of a list of, like, eight things. And one of them was flip a coin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you know, just, you know, nothing, you know, there was nothing. And so like, uh, I remember going into the 74 tournament, it, actually in 73, it happened to me in Missoula. One of my balls popped out at four, four and the ball, it, and it didn't count. And my goalie oh. left the goalie rods, walked around to the other side of the table. Meanwhile, those two tables realized that the ball's still alive. And hit it in our goal. Oh and my! I lost. Ooh. Why did he walk away? Yeah, and, because he he didn't realize the ball popped out of the goal. Oh, got it. Okay, okay. So he yeah. just thought it was over. Yeah. So you had, and there was no such thing. There was no jarring rule. Nothing. <laughs> Not you know, absolutely nothing. And uh, I I kind of went through that uh, with a guy a little a little while back. Uh, I was playing Daryl Krogh in Missoula. That's at Tournament Soccer's first and only tournament that year, and you got the number one national ranking for winning there. So you're, it was pretty much their nationals for the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was called the Northwest Table Soccer Championships. I'm playing this guy, Daryl Krogh, and he was using this bar trick where you set up the pole and then you slam the, the five bar against the, uh -huh. the wall yeah. of yeah. the table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it may cause you to jump but keep in mind these were tournament soccer tables these were pieces of balsa wood and he <laughs> hit the side of that table man and and i swear the table would move a quarter inch wow and he'd slam it straight in on me and i wouldn't have even moved 
And so I started banging the table back. Yeah. And uh, I think it was one of the first rulings ever. One of the first rule, instant rules ever. Pepper came out and said, okay, Bowers, you can't be banging the table. And I go, well, what about him hitting the side with that bar trick? He goes, well, that's causing a nervous reaction. I go, you don't think it's making him nervous when his men (laughs) fall down when I bang the table? And so anyway, I got ruled against. But uh, that gave me so much motivation that Krug didn't win another game. The no, man. While, over right while we're on rules, I got to ask this question of Mike Bowers. I'm not a fan of the distraction rule. I think it's a garbage rule. I don't think very many real sports have a distracted, like a distraction rule like ours, where you can't talk and you can't engage. And it's just like, I don't know what the hell happened to our sport. Why is, why is there a distraction rule, Mike? And do you think I'm so glad be? you brought that up, Mark? Go for because it. Because <laughs> over the years, the distraction rule which distinctly says in it may be judged a distraction mm-hmm. has is now interpreted as is a distraction mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. will be so, so, well it it has been it's morphed into that so like let's say my forward gets the ball on the three rod and i look at him and i say to him softly you know nothing uh, major uh no drama class and I say, no, don't set up the pull, set up the push kick. Is that a distraction? Nowadays, yeah. that's a distraction. Huh. When I played, perfectly legit. Yeah, it's horrible. Okay, now, it also says, away from the ball in play. Well, <laughs> why does it need to be the, away from the ball in play? Distraction can happen anytime. It can happen right on the ball in play something happens there. so uh like i said that's just one of those rules that's morphed out of control it mm. was precedent was never like that it's like that now so you have a you have a great gripe there mark great thank you taking yeah. it to the yeah, judge and, you're, and really it's, you know a distraction is not a distraction really unless there's an official there to make that call it is it remains for the most part a, a judgment call and i think maybe it just comes down to the education of of referees to kind of a, give a little allowance. You absolutely should be allowed to move up to your, you know, talk to your forward and say, you know, shoot your push kick instead of your pull shot yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, you exactly. Know, you that, like I said, it's, you just, just, shoot it right it's away. just morphed into people hearing noise. And, ah, that's a distraction, you know? So, and then, you know, back to the rules thing, you know, the lack of rules in the beginning, <clears throat> right, be- right at the 74 tournament, there was the first rules meeting ever with the WTSA World Table Soccer Association. And they voted the pop out rule as illegitimate. If it went in, it's like hockey. Doesn't matter if it comes out of the net, it counts. Jeez. So they voted that in, but it was not to take effect until after the tournament. Okay. Hmm. So here we go. We play the tournament. I watch a team from Colorado Springs, Mark Naniga and uh, Dana uh, Arbach. Uh, they, uh, they're playing matches. I'm watching one of their matches. Dana pops eight or ten pulls out of the goal while I'm watching. Absolutely unequivocally won the match, hands down, 3-0, and they lost mm-hmm. 3-0. Really? Wow. So, so, and it's because that rule was not to take effect until the first tournament on the 75 tour. So uh, here I come along into the finals. I'm playing Del Fallon. And the first game, I pop three out. I, I two count, I pop three out. So I scored five goals and he wins the game. Oh. So I won the first game, but I lost. Second game, I get credit for three goals, but I popped two out. So I won the second game also. And now I'm down 0-2. But without those strange rules in place, what happened next could not have happened. I scored the next 15 points in a row, won the next three games, 5-0, 5-0, 5-0. And that's the only time that's been done in the history of foosball. And especially in a world champion final. Forget about any other tournament. I've never heard of any accredited tournament ever where there's been a 15-0 in the finals. (laughs) <laughs> so so without that without those rules i never would have got that record 
So uh, I guess I have to thank uh, God for the rules. <laughs> 15 no. what happened to the poor bastard you beat in the finals? Did he just like go, go find a cave and live there for the rest of his life? It's, brutal, <laughs> it, it's like uh, Ace Ventura, pet detective, the guy who missed the field goal. But it, it's, uh, uh, no, it, the, guy's, the guy was a great guy, Dale Fallon. He set records in the tournament that still haven't been broken. He went in the loser's bracket second round. And went all the way through the losers bracket on a 512 team bracket wow. and made mm. it to the final. He played more matches than anybody ever has in a tournament Jeez. to get second. And so uh, this is the funny part. So four weeks ago, I get a, a messenger from Dana Dietrich in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And he goes, he goes, you know, I know, I know Dale Fallon stuff. He goes, but I just heard something. That in the finals, the score was 2 5 3 5, 5 0, 5 0, 5 0. He goes, That obviously did not happen. So, w- what's the truth? Can you please tell me what the truth is? <laughs> and so, uh, uh, I have a history of not responding to stuff like that. <laughs> and so, I didn't respond. And uh, two weeks later, he hits me again and he goes, Well, obviously that did happen. He goes, My apology. <laughs> so it's so much better when people find out from somebody other than me mm-hmm. that they find out virally somewhere else that that actually happened. And of course, I had the testimonial from the great Billy Sumption at one of Jim Stevens Hall of Fame presentations. And he got on the microphone and he goes, I watched the match that did happen. And he goes, one other thing I'm going to put on top of that is Bowers was 15 for 15. Whatever wow. rod the ball came to, he scored from there. And what few people realize in that match is I only had one drop, the first drop. I dropped it into my right-handed five bar and did a pull kick. And I made eight right-hand shots from the five bar. Whoa. I never made one pass during the 15-0. Never made one pass. Three times it came to my three row, flying around the table. I went three for three. Four times Fallon actually, he only made four passes in three games. And four times he got it on his three row. I blocked him and went four for four pull shots from the back. Jeez. So I was 15 for, you know, it was like, I don't know what happened there. It was like (laughs) the twilight zone, you know? All of a sudden, I was just in the zone. I, you know, we were in the fifth day of the tournament. I'd had six hours sleep in the last 60 hours. Jeez. And I was a zombie. And Charles, uh, I, Charles, I, was, I, the guy, was, was the guy you were playing like seven years old? No, just kidding. <laughs> no, he was Dale Ballard. He was, <laughs> he was in his <laughs> but, uh, The only I, time I've ever hit eight five bar shots with my right hand was against my nine year old nephew, Sammy, just a heads and, up on and that. I <laughs> walked up to Jim Stevens' predecessor. You know, I, I you know, I, I, years, a few years back when I endorsed Gary Tender for, for getting into the Hall of Fame, the original tournament soccer announcer, I had said in my email, you know, we have the gold standard in Jim Stevens, mm-hmm. and we really do, Jim. Mm-hmm. And uh, Thank you, Mike. But Gary Tender was the Iron Man. And when I walked up to him at the end of, uh, you know, t- after that match, he goes, let me get this straight. He goes, was that 2535505050? And I said, yeah, it was. And he goes, Powers, he goes, I know, I know you're not even thinking about this right now. You're a fucking zombie, but excuse my French, but he goes, nobody's ever going to do that again. And I thought, I I just sort of laughed, you know, because I wasn't thinking of that at all. I just sort of laughed. And now as the years go by, uh, I wouldn't mind seeing somebody do it again. It would Mm. be so phenomenal if somebody like Spreederman stepped up and 15 owed somebody, uh, it would, I would be in awe of that to tell you the truth. And, yeah. uh, even though I, I did that, uh, it, it's hard feeling that, that you did that. <laughs> I, I just don't yeah. know what to think about it. Like I said, it was the twilight zone. I was so, I was so out of it at the time, mentally and physically, that it was, it was just uh, one of those moments in time you look back on and go, wow, I'm glad I was there. 
So, Mike yeah. was was uh, <laughs> was foosball back then more physical? I mean, were you were you uh, putting more into it physically than they do much these more, days? Much more physical. Okay. And uh, part of it was that the tables of the day were finesse tables. Hmm. You could do far more with the table than you can the tornado. Gotcha. And you could do free, free, you know, full speed uh, north and south moves. If you try to do full speed north and south on tornado, it's going to bounce off the man. The men mm -hmm. are just too hard. And so uh, you guys were talking about the multi-table sport. <clears throat> and what struck me right then was I learned, I first started playing on the foosball match. I was proficient on that, the Deutschmeister, the Vulcan, the tornado, the champion, the American, and the tournament soccer. So don't think for a minute that those old players weren't proficient on multiple tables mm -hmm. and, and how that got weeded out. It's, uh, uh, it's all about what you said earlier, Tom, about it's the money. Okay. And when the table started putting up the money, it weeded out who you were playing on. Right. right and right, right. when tournament soccer made the jump to the light speed, from a five grander in 73 to a 50 grander in 74, they put us in the same category as tennis. Right. When they first started pro tennis in late 60s, the first tournament at Wimbledon was 68,000. Our first big one was 50. Damn. We were right there with them. Yeah. Believe it or not, look this up, foosball fact checkers. Laurie Schranz and Karen Gillan made more money than Billie Jean King in 1975. Oh, seriously. That's intense. So, not, you know, when I tell people we're a top 10 sport, we were a top 10 sport. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, we're probably the only one that's ever fallen from grace, you know, and from top 10. And when you look at Wimbledon, I use that as an example, 68 grand. You know how much it was last year? Thirty-eight million. Right. Think about if we had kept pace with them. Ugh. And uh, you know, we had the sponsor in '77, that big one that Lafredo won. You know, 1977 quarter million dollar tournament, and Schlitz had their name all over that. Of course. And uh, they had it in St. Louis. There were three thousand people in the stands watching <sighs> Lafredo win the final. No kidding. Lafredo and Jackson. Wow, and, and the and the promotional statement at, by tournament soccer at the time was, yeah, we started this tournament with three thousand players and four spectators. We ended it with four players and three thousand spectators. <laughs> that's uh, that's a, a very interesting uh, attention span for those players. They stayed the entire time. They never left the building. I take it. Yep, brief moment in time. You got nineteen seventy four to nineteen eighty one where millions of dollars were given away in foosball. Wow. So unfortunate that it went over the cliff in 81. Uh, I, I did not react to it well. Uh, my depression was heavy, mm. and uh, I, I floundered. I, I have to admit, I floundered in life. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, I so wish I'm... that foosball had continued on. I'd still be playing it if it was big money. and. Uh, you guys did an, a really nice playback for me earlier tonight with the 1998 yes. Masters. And uh, I literally came out of a black hole there. At 47. And, yeah, and, and I wanted it. I wanted that record. All those records you talked about, oldest guy to win, first Hall of Famer, blah, 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 blah. I hadn't won a major in 13 years, you know. Wow. So uh, I was motivated to to win that tournament. I was blessed to play with Scotty there. and we turned out to be a fantastic team. And of course you played the finish. That was a really exciting finish, especially for an old buzzard like me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, we've had a chance on this show to talk to some of the great players in, in the history of the sport in, you know, all of us uh, experienced that 81 crash, you know, to some on a, a larger level than others. I was a young player in California and it happened overnight and it was shocking to all of us, but it wasn't as if I was out on tour traveling throughout the late seventies, from city to city and what magical days those were. But 
you know, for someone who was so immersed in the tour, it was so much part of your life. It was your living. And we hear this from, from all of the players that we've talked to who experienced this. And then it was gone. It, it was literally gone overnight. And the vacuum that that left in, in each of you, obviously, you just said how depressed you were. But, um, you know, talk a little bit more about, about what it was like, first of all, to tour city to city in the 70s. What a marvelous thing that was. Uh, playing foosball full time for a living, e creating this evolution of the sport, which th that style that you guys created in the 70s, we're, we're still basically playing that American style today. But then for it all to come to an end in 81. So talk about the, the highs and then the lows of that. Well, the, the highs are easy because, uh, again, Tom talked about it earlier. And am, I, am I saying it right? Is it Tom or Tim? Tom. Tom, Tom yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom, right. Heroes. Okay. The Montana Cowboy, E. Lee Peppard, that created tournament soccer and cre created the phenomenon and the frenzy of foosball in the United States, looked at me one day and he goes, Bowers, he goes, if I don't create heroes, sport fails. Yes. I have to create heroes. I want the money to be bigger and bigger and bigger. He goes... The reason I have you interview, you know, in every city is because you can talk about it right? And, and talk about it intelligently and it comes off well. And uh, so he, he always had me out front there. Plus, they paid me a small stipend to not play on other tables. Hmm. So all those other tables that I talked about, those became off limits to me. Oh. And it was well worth it because I think they paid me like three or 400 bucks a month. They gave me all my clothes, all my foos gear, my visors, you know, nice. uh, entry fees and all the tournaments. Uh, only thing I had to do was pay hotel and airplane and show up, you know, and I, I was sponsored. And so, and then I had multiple sponsors. I had some sponsors that paid airplane fees, some that paid hotel. So I'd go there and I'd kind of be on a free ride. That's great. And then we got the foosball players were very hip to transportation from airports. And we realized that taking limos <laughs> was cheaper than taking a cab. <laughs> so we'd show up at the airport and we'd take limos. Hello. And we would look like we were somebody. <laughs> and then... Uh, uh, you know, like I said, we got on a lot of TV shows. I was on games. People play. I was no on kidding. PM magazine, you know, things were happening. I was up for an American express commercial. Hey, you don't know me, but blah, blah, blah. I don't know if you remember those commercials. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. And so, uh, it was just a happening time. It was just a fantastic time to be playing foosball in America and the top 20 players. We're making enough money that they didn't have to do anything else. That's so it. you got 20, 30 players that are making a living from it. What a fantasy that and is. What's that? What a fantasy. I mean, these days, you think of that, just a, it's just a fantasy. There's one or two people that can do that now. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. But, uh, you know, and then when it did go, it, when it did create, it was such a fantastic time. And you guys were talking about, you know, the entertainment event aspect of them. And, mm. and on Saturday night, tournament soccer had a band playing, and oh. there was always a hospitality suite going, and Gary Pollock would play his guitar in there with the old foosball songs and stuff. And the ambience, ambience at, a, at a foosball tournament was something special. Right. And uh, they treated us special. And uh, like I said, we got publicity. We, wherever we were in the city, uh, whatever city we were in, we were probably the biggest sporting event that weekend. And so all the sporting, uh, uh, you know, the channel, not the news, the sports news, all those guys would cover us. So it was just a fun, fun time. And, uh, you know, if you talk to any, any of these top players of the day back then, Wiswell, Furry, Kaiser, Lott, Martin, you know, it was just, it was incredible. It was incredible. And, <clears throat> you know, none of the, None of the top players continued on after 1981. Mm. Uh, when it went over a foosball, only the rising stars of tournament soccer really stayed with the tour. And I'm talking about people like Dave Gummison, 
right. Ty Lafredo, Tom Spear, you know, they stayed out there. But, you know, the, the tip top players, the top 10 players, uh uh-uh. uh, hmm. they didn't play at all anymore. Wow. You know what's, well, you know what's I, tragic I recall... about that? Let me say something about this because it's, yeah, it's, it's what's tragic about that. Is it's 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 specific to foosball. When you talk about a top ten sport falling out of grace, no other sport doing that. When that thing happens, that's traumatic to the sport because you have legacy knowledge and history yeah. and um, archived information on the game, and not just that, the psychology of the game, the poise, the composure. When all those guys just stop playing, and there's no lineage, and there's no progeny or tutelage. It it and dies. Evolution, evolution. Right. Yeah. It Stops. dies. Yeah, yeah, right. And so people have to pick up the pieces, and it's been it's taken decades for people to climb back and do. And it's probably it's it's dead and gone forever. So the game when we talk about the sport evolving, when those great great players stop playing and don't pass on everything, including the psychology. Most importantly, the psychology of winning. You get what we we have. You get with a handful of players dominating and passing it on maybe to another small um, number of players, but the sport fails to evolve the way other sports evolve. And that's a traumatic and a tragedy of that. I, you know, I agree. <clears throat> I agree with that, you know, and I had that evolution going because like Todd Lafredo played out of my game room. No doubt. Okay? When I'm out there on the 74, 75, 76 tour winning, Todd's a teenager in my game room watching all this. Mm-hmm. And he tells me one day, he goes, he, he goes, he goes, my, my mom just moved three blocks from here. I'm going to be here every day. <laughs> he goes, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you can, you know, help me. He goes, I, I want to be a world champion. Wow. It's exactly what he told me. There's hero worship right there. He, you were his hero and that's why he, he succeeded. Yeah, and now he's one of mine. Yeah. How how fitting <laughs> how fitting and poetic is it that one of the few guys, one of the few great champion, champions that stuck around to support the game spawned the next era of greatest champions ever between Lafredo and Spear and Maloney and the rest of that crew. There should have that should have happened in a and natural Colin organ- and Weidman. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. look Terry, at that. Terry Moore and Robert Morris. But the, the, yeah, look the, at that the, pack. We talk about the yeah, and Mares. Mares moved to Colorado in the early right. 90s. Here, here you go. This leads right into that what you guys played earlier with me winning the Masters. Right. Mars comes here and he goes, can you just play me a few times? Just spar <laughs> with me a few nights and give me a few tips. Next thing you know, we're playing three and four nights a week, and he's teaching me how to play on Tornado. Wow. <clears throat> and that culminated in the 98 Masters. But there should have been one of you, Mike, in a in a natural order. There should have been some iteration of you in every other state right. doing that. And it's unfortunate it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I was very proud to be from Colorado. And when Pepper told me in 73 at the Nationals, I'm thinking about having the tournament in Denver. And I looked at Denver as my turf. If right. there's a tournament coming there. <laughs> I've absolutely got to win it. I was in training for a full year to win that tournament. And he quizzed me. He goes, what's the, what's the base like in Colorado? And I said, well, right now there's about 10 tournaments a week. And he goes, damn, what? 10 tournaments a week. He <laughs> goes, that's not even possible, is it? I go, well, I know there's only seven days, but some nights of the week, there's tournaments in two places. Wow. Yeah. Oh, man. And so there was your dynamic. And here's the unbelievable dynamic. Even though that all these places were competitors of each other, they all cooperated. Mm -hmm. They would put up posters and go, okay, on Monday, there's tournaments at this place and this place. Tuesday, this place. And so in every place where there were tournaments, you could see where all the other tournaments were. And the cooperation level was super high. And, uh, it was, uh, I never had a tournament that didn't liquidate it. Uh, you know, I opened up Doc's Foos Hall in 1975. It was written up in Play Meter magazine, the busiest foosball location in the world. 24,000 games played every month. Whoa, 24,000. 
<laughs> yes. That's a lot of quarters, baby. Yes, so sir. Was raking it in. What was the, you that, that was at a, that was at a quarter. A quarter. Just, oh you know, and, yeah. and so I tell people all the time, yeah, if you open up a, a foosball game room, make it a quarter a play. <laughs> and they go, how could we do that? And I go, because you'll make, you'll make Buku money. You'll get every quarter in every kid's pocket, every single one. Yep. That's and it's great. a skill game, and, and it, it, you know, these things spawn from nickel arcades. If you mm-hmm. make foosball a bargain, people will play it. Wow. It's... Yeah, I recall the, the 25 cent days and went to 50, then, then on and on. Um, you, you obviously were a hugely successful player in the, in the 1970s. You, you, you picked up a win on Tornado. Between that was the Dynamo Tour. That's where, you know, once the, 80, the crash of 81 occurred, Dynamo with Kathy Brainerd, et cetera, sort of picked things up. I know you stuck around. Um, you talked earlier about the fact that this guy, this this Libyan, this this North African push kicker, uh, drilled you. Well, I, I can tell you uh, that Mike Bowers learned how to block a push kick. 1982, U.S. <laughs> Open, Los Angeles. My, my partner Clint Coyne and I, we I'm rolling, and I roll through eight matches in the winners bracket. I'm drilling everybody, just killing them with my push kick, right? I get to the winner's bracket final as, as a novice player with my, my partner, Clint Coyne, uh, who we paired up right before the event. And, and you guys have heard me talk about this a little bit. But winner's bracket final, I face Greg Perry, the Hall of Famer, and Mike Bowers. I think I scored maybe three on you. I think I out five G, but, you know, about three to oh, one. Got funny. the ball, but I just could not score a push kick on Mike Bowers. So he obviously learned how to block that particular shot in 1982. And he probably doesn't even remember. Maybe you remember that. but um, Yeah, I do remember his- that. and. My my push kick emanated from having my roommate Steve Crocker just drill me over and over and over, just rip up, just rip me to shreds with his push kick. <laughs> and finally, one day I stood there and I said, "Okay, shoot push kicks. I'm not leaving this table until I have a push kick defense." And that's when the three the three man push kick mm, D yeah. emerged, mm, yeah. and it changed the whole landscape. Changed the whole landscape. You did because you weren't. I couldn't outrace you because you weren't racing me anymore, right? You were. You were outthinking me. Is is what it there came you go. down and to. And the ultimate and, uh, compliment. I'll never forget for, it. The ultimate compliment for me back then was when uh, Doug Furry was at my house one day, and he goes, "Will you please show me the three man D?" <laughs> so, mm. wow. you know, I got wow. to show some of the other yeah. top players. Speaking of those other top players, talk a little bit about the guys that you faced in in those years you mentioned uh, Wiswell, you mentioned furry of course dan kaiser rick martin etc you know among that group who who gave you the biggest challenge who did you really have the most respect for uh standing across the table from the who impressed you the most uh, well a little bit about uh, the, other stars the first in the player game. that impressed me was steve simon because uh i ended up passing yeah. my torch to him in singles and we had a great rivalry there for about a year going back and forth winning tournaments and Dan Kaiser, unbelievably, Dan Kaiser, I, uh, if, if I have to look at a rivalry, you know, my, my top rivalry, it was uh, at Dan Kaiser. And if you look at our resumes, if one or the other of us hadn't showed up every time, the other one would have had twice as many wins. Mm. So I had to play him a lot, <laughs> uh, and especially in big time finals in Portland, in the world championships. Uh, so, uh, yeah, multiple times with Dan Kaiser in finals, Columbus, uh, Portland, other tournaments, both of us had incredible records in Portland. Him and Martin had like a 22 string record at the same time. I was undefeated in Portland and all the majors. So, uh, again, that was quite a rivalry, uh, Johnny Lott. Very impressive because he crossed the line. He won an open doubles and an open singles. Uh, I look at that as one of the toughest things that happened during the tournament soccer era. How many players won an open doubles and an open singles in Worlds? And there's only three. And maybe Rick Martin is a fourth. And if you count super singles for Furry, then he essentially did it. Uh, at the Hall of Fame tournament a couple of years back when Furry showed up, I talked about his run where he won a uh, Porsche, uh, <laughs> $30,000 cash, a, a, a Corvette, a Mustang. That's the greatest run in the history of foosball. 
And that kind of shows you how big foosball actually was. Sure. And then other top uh, players, Mike Bells. Uh, Mike Bells was the money winner playing in open, only open doubles and open mixed, which is, which is quite a feat, you know? And uh, uh, so, you know, he was another one that was uh, definitely a factor pretty much all the way through the eighties. And, uh, you know, all these players had their runs. If you look at it, man, they, they would have these runs for three, you know, two, three, four or five years. But to have the run all the way through the tournament soccer era from 73 to 81, I count myself blessed to be in the thick of things as long as I was. Right. And, Absolutely. Uh, I, I look at, uh, you know, what would have gone on in the 80s. And I, I know I would have been a good goalie for a long time. And, uh, <clears throat> so as I expounded on earlier, that, that was, that hurt. It hurt when it went down. So Mike, give us some perspective when it came to the biggest tournaments you played in, when you stepped up to the table for a final match, the finals, what was going through your mind <clears throat> and how much research did you, how, would you have done with your opponents on the other side of the table? How much did you know about your opponent before you stepped up to the table? Great question. I had a notebook really? and uh, I had a, a profile of every player. Mm. And so I would read my profile of that player. And uh, uh, so I, I would be ready for him. Really? And uh, let me see, what was the other aspect of that question? So essentially uh, when you stepped up, you know, how are you, you know, oh, prepared? Okay. As I'm coming into a match, uh, I had my own, like, I'll call it a self-hypnotic uh, <laughs> preparation going into the match. And I always wanted to be scared. Really? I wanted to be afraid of the other person. I'd read the profile on them, and I'd know their strengths. And so I would start letting the fear subside as I knew their, as I realized their game, as I played through their game with ah, me. Okay. And then I wanted that anxiety and fear to give me adrenaline. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to have the ability that when the coin was flipped, my, my, my switch also flipped switch. Now it's not fear. Now it's the adrenaline of aggression. Aha. Uh -huh. And the the aggression cannot be reckless aggression. Right. It has to be assertive aggression. So you keep the turnovers and the mistakes out of your game, but nonetheless, you're going for it. Mm -hmm. So uh like I said, it it's it's about preparation. You come to the tournament, you want to feel the feel of being in the final. Sure. That's why you came there. And and once you've you've been there and you've mastered it, now you want it again and again. It's like an endorphin fix every time yeah, you come an addiction. in. Addiction, yes. You know you're in the finals again. And and uh, one of my big things too was you, you get to the final, Mike. You better close the deal. You <laughs> yeah, didn't man. come here to get <laughs> second. Yeah. Okay, dude. I, so I, I, don't be afraid to get. You know, don't okay. be. Don't have fear because you think now, you're going to get second. Now's prime time for me to ask my question. I ask this question to the great winners that come on the show, and it's the same question over and over. I am fascinated by the psycho. I do a lot of other things, and professionally in my own field, I compete foosball. You don't know a ton about me, Mike, but foosball is where I spent the least time and energy developing my skill set. So, uh, I it, this is true for foosball, and it's true for just about any other sport, a small percentage of guys win. A small percentage of guys or gals get over the hump, and they usually command the sport for a short or long, longer time, but still there's a great many more people that never win. They take second or third. Now, you're a great winner, and everyone can approach this a little bit differently, but for you, it's a 4-4 four, four ball. You get it on your, your five bar or your three bar, what go? Where is your head? How do you separate yourself from the guys mm. that are going to flub that, or choke, or send the ball going backward, or make the wrong decision? What's going on? Well, it's what about? It's what you're thinking about at the moment, and you better be thinking about your regular game, which is what's your number one pass that's going to get you the ball. Mm -hmm. What's your number one shot that's going to win and close the deal? And you have to be a stone cold killer 
Yeah. And, it, and it, that's part of your hypnosis, your frame of mind. And yeah. Kobe Bryant, when he was talking about the Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and Draymond Green, and they were asking him about that team, and he, he, it was easy for him. He goes, easy answer. He goes, those guys are stone-cold killers. Mm. Yeah. And, it, and it just rang. Killer it just another. rang. Yeah. So Killer right instinct. Yeah. You know, the Mamba mentality, for sure, coming from, from Kobe. And he's, of course, handed that down to so many people. And it sounds like you had that a little bit before Kobe did. Um, for sure. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I tell you, it's my my Libyan mentor instilled that into me. Yeah, he goes, don't be soft on people, and he goes, when you score a point, don't you dare let up. That's when you need to bear down harder. And uh, he goes, there's so much into when you make a string of points. You know that how you're breaking your opponent down mentally. They start thinking about, God, I need to get one point. They're not thinking about the pass and the shot. They're thinking, I need to get one point. So they're thinking about the wrong thing. So you're breaking them down mentally. And he was just so right. And I never knew how it was going to play out like it did at Elitch's because the further I got into that string, the harder it was for Dale Fallon to score a point. Right, 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 right. No, give them no opportunities. Yep. Wow. And I, and I just didn't let up. I just would not let myself up. I had already had the scare of losing two games. I had already had the burn of five balls popping out of the goal. And Man. I, you know, I just couldn't let it happen. I can't imagine that, <laughs> that being, being a rule. Just, it just, it seems so foreign. That would be something that would be accepted. That, the ball went in the hole. Well, as in every sport, you go back far enough, you get to barbarian rules. <laughs> and we were straight barbarian then. <laughs> Total barbarian. I love it. Wow. Well, things have changed. Yeah. Uh, sometimes not necessarily for the good though. So speaking of which, uh, when it comes to today's game, um now what do you what do you think about uh we've been talking about this a lot in fact tonight we had the, the question well how do we bring people back to this game what do you what do you think what's the number one thing it's we, the same we're not thing doing? it always was it was the money yeah when okay. tournament soccer announced that fifty thousand dollar tournament it i mean every gunslinger every foosball champ in every bar in every small town in every locale, mm -hmm. in every region, in every state, everywhere, they saw that 50 grand and they were a gunslinger and they were going to go there and win it. Yeah. And you're not going to see another uh, environment like that because so many foosball players know each other. But let me tell you something. If somebody popped out of there right now, and let's go with the equivalent of a 50 grander in 74, mm -hmm. and you run like a 300 grander. Now, now keep in mind, in 74, there was only four categories. If you ran a 300 grander with four categories and everyone had to play in that same category of huh. open doubles, uh, yeah, they're going to come out of the woodwork for it. They're going to come from all over the world for that, even for a $300,000 tournament. And you can still run all those other sub events. Sure. But if you put that three grand up there, uh, they're going to start coming out of the woodwork. And if you do the equivalent, keep in mind, again, Wimbledon went from 68 grand to 38 million. Can you imagine huh. if somebody ran a $10 million tournament, oh what the God. zoo would be like? Yeah. Do you know how you'd have to have a thousand tables there? Easily. Easily. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, serious money. Speaking of which, the 50 year anniversary is coming up of Elitches in 2024. Huh. So I would encourage the Chapmans. Walters, Mary Moore, to scheme on getting that tournament held in Denver. I think the 50-year tournament should be in Denver. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? So there's a suggestion. I'm throwing that out. Hmm. Jim, can you make that happen? Yeah, we'll make that happen for sure, Mike. <laughs> Consider it done. Um, Mark Torres okay, and I maybe should do that. Good. Maybe We're all on the same thing. <laughs> I know a guy. I know a guy. Anyway, go ahead. All right. You know a guy. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> All right. As long as you show up and play as well, Mike, uh, consider it done. You know, you All talked right. about how you were one of the few guys, and maybe the only guy when you when you look at the record that really spanned the, the entire uh, tournament soccer era uh, from that uh, that uh, tournament in Missoula, that famous tournament in 1973, obviously Elish Gardens in '74. 
And then right up through 1980, when when you won the world championship, you won the East West playoff. You and uh, and Zeke, I think it was, wasn't it? We're going up yep. against uh, Rick Martin and Dan Kaiser in the final. Um, you know, and, and so you kind of spanned that whole era, and then you kind of extended a little bit beyond that. Um, compare a little bit, if you don't mind, the the play style of that era. And I, I talk about this often. You know, you guys were playing for money. You were playing for a living. You were scouting each other. You were you were reading note, making notebooks about about every other competitor. Um, and the evolution of the sport accelerated at such a rate that because it had to, right? You had to beat that guy next week because he beat you last week or whatever. You had to adapt or die. But that's when the American style was created, and it really evolved quickly into this very high level of play, one that has continued throughout the world today. Obviously, it's evolved with the snake shot and some other things, the high lane pass, the slingshots, whatever. But in essence, it's still the same game. It was created back then. Did you have a sense back then, um, as you played weekly, every couple of weeks, and you travel here and you go there and you would follow the tour, did you have a sense that you were creating something, that this was evolving, continuously evolving into where it became by the end of the tournament soccer era, a very, very high level of play, again, that has been continued down to today? Oh, yeah. I mean, keep in mind, when I started playing, there's no tournaments. There's no, there's no, there's no $100 tournaments anywhere. And so I was immersed in it, and I, I was hoping and praying that what happened would happen, and it happened beyond my dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, Ely Pepper took this thing, you know, as far as it could go, really, and uh, without a sponsor. And, uh, you know, I'll always tip my hat to him for that, uh, regardless of what happened at the end. And that's the guy that made me a hero. We talked about, you know, you got to have the heroes, and he made me the hero. And the elect, you, uh, Jim, you talk about how fast the evolution was. I'll, show, I'll tell you how fast the evolution was. Look at Todd Lafredo. Uh, what you know, one of the all time greatest ever to play. He wins the 77 tournament, okay? Comes in there with the blazing five bar fat, double pump fast wall and an equally lethal, you know, pull shot. Mm -hmm. And he wins 77, one of the biggest tournaments ever. When did Lafredo win again? Yeah, it was a few years, wasn't 80, it? 80 something. Yeah, it was into the 80s. He never won on tournament soccer again. Huh. Okay, now let's go back to the evolution. He showed up with the top pass and the top shot. It was obsolete the next tournament. Jeez. Wow. Nobody would let that fast wall through there. If, 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 if Lafredo flinched, they were on the wall. <laughs> and so there's your evolution. They ganged up on that. And, and everybody, you know, Talk to each other, communicated to each other. How do you stop that kid from Colorado? <laughs> and they did, you know, and that's how it happened in foosball back then. If somebody would get onto something that was maybe a little bit gimmicky, uh, it would get removed from the game. Wow. And, uh, you know, so it was, uh, it was a very interesting time. And yeah, uh, it was, adjust. it was great, and great to see it happen. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you're a, you're a foosball fan. I know that your your knowledge of the game, even the modern game, continues to always impress me. Each time, you know, we 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 work that the Hall of Fame ceremony in Las Vegas each year, and in Colorado for the Colorado State Hall of Fame, et cetera. And you you stay up to date on the game, no question about it. Well, kind of that's seen... because Lafredo lives here, so <laughs> I see Lafredo all the time. So uh, he keeps me pretty much abreast of what's going on. And then, of course, Mares lives within two miles. That's so nice. he's always updating me on cool. what's going on with the game. So there you go. Two of the all-time greats are keeping me current. Yeah, for sure. And the, not only, I mean, how aware are you of what's going on internationally? Obviously, the World Cup, you know, the, the different tables, the ITSF. All yeah, I see that. Stay I stay try to. That. Yeah, and I try to keep up with those name brands. And as we're talking right now, I'm taking my my Broncos cap off and I'm putting on my my Mikan cap and this Mikan softball uh, cap is from what's it say here? 2006. And I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember the performance, Jim, I'm sure you do of Tracy McMillan in the yeah. 2006 final against Lafredo yeah. and Colonia. And oh, yeah. Tracy McMillan went off from the goalie. Mm -hmm. 
And it's probably the greatest performance I've ever seen offensively by a goalie in a world championship. Yeah, I agree. And, I agree. and you know, he Mike, grabbed... Mike, Mike, no disrespect, you didn't see my 1990 amateur doubles win, but please continue. Except oh. for maybe the Torres match. <laughs> except for yeah, maybe that. Right. Okay, so uh, <laughs> McMillan grabs his hat and launches that yes. puppy. And I, I'm, I I'm standing... I'm standing on the top bleacher, and right as it's about to go over my head, I snatch that thing out of the air. That's great. And I wow. went and had McMillan and Gummison sign it. <laughs> and the funniest thing is, Tracy McMillan signs that thing perfectly like it was one of his bank checks. <laughs> That's awesome. Dave Gummison was so giddy that <laughs> yeah. his hand was like shaking a half an inch every time. Wow. And he could barely sign this thing. And it was just so cool to see. That's just awesome. so cool yeah. to see the excitement, you know, and the decades that Gummison had put in Tracy too. But, you know, Gummison was like a little kid. And it was just so refreshing to see. No, oh, it was. And in and, and I don't forget those moments. Was good <laughs> that was Dave. That was Dave's first open doubles world title, right? After yeah. decades, yeah. decades yeah. and decades of being a, you know, a true student of the game and working his tail off. Can you imagine? Like at that point, even when Adrian won his title with Eddie Gartman, they, they can't believe they won that event. They've been yeah. trying their entire lives. So it is a beautiful moment. Yeah. And I yeah, was I going for the well. world championships even after I quit. And people would ask me, why do you still go to that? You don't even really play anymore. Why do you still go to that? And I go, to tell you the truth, I just want to see what it takes to win these days. Mm hmm. But, you know, and being in the environment gives me a little bit of the feel of the feel of the old days. So, yeah, I'd love to re see the old girl return to her former glory, but remains to be seen. I keep buying lotto tickets. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe something one day, you know, I am working on it. <laughs> so so you are mortal after all that that's uh, oh, there you go <laughs> yeah yeah okay well it's 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 refreshing but also disheartening at the same time if you if you get my drift but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no it's it's amazing that you have been the hero to so many um so these days the the young youngsters are, that are coming up there's there's a few that are uh outstanding have you uh, seen any of them play i've seen uh Everett Lee Garten play. Okay. He's a five-year-old, lives in Boulder, Colorado. He's my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, he's the only up-and-comer I know. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Is he making Along progress? with my granddaughter, Nella Gray. <laughs> so, I have to put in a, a, a mention to them. So you're bringing up but the next generation then. Yep. Awesome. We got a couple pictures of, with him on foosball table, so it's pretty funny. Awesome. No, it's uh, it, it has to start young, oftentimes. But the uh, the the efforts of uh, Foosball Clubs USA with John O'Brien and uh, those those guys, I mean, they're they're really making their best effort to get foosball in schools. Now, you didn't start until you were college, for goodness' sake. Now, if you had started when you were in, let's say, middle school, what kind of player do you then think you would have been? My name would be Tony Spreederman. Yeah, right. <laughs> Seriously. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's you know, one of the things I find so cool about you know talking with with players who were there in the 70s is how vivid the memories are. You, yeah. I mean, you can literally remember individual plays, individual shots, mm -hmm. moments from that era. Oh yeah, I mean, it was like big it was, time stuff. It was big time stuff. Yeah, and for the and, and, and for many of you, it was some of the glory days of your life. And if reflecting back on it, in many cases, it was maybe the best times of your lives. And it, it's always pretty amazing that. Oh, I've today, said it many times, Jim. If I could, if I could get on a bus and go back to 1970, I'd do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd yep. win more tournaments this time. <laughs> 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 well you, hey, you did pretty well as uh it, you know it, with what you did for sure even though you started a little late in life uh you know these days these kids these these young players and by young i mean guys like ryan moore tony spreadham and billy pappas they all started when they were eight or ten years old tiger woods you know sort of thing mm -hmm. but here you were oh yeah and that's one other thing i was going to mention the uh you know you talked about some people make it and win and some people don't okay I can tell you the people that don't make it what the problem is. They're not outliers. And what I mean by that is they don't have their 10,000 hours in. Yeah. Right. Okay. Agreed. 
the, the guys that want to win, they got their 10,000 hours in and then some, mm-hmm. and they become an outlier. They make themselves a champion. I, and, I'm a big, I'm know, a big advocate of the 10,000 hours. I talk about 10,000 hours quite a bit on the show, so I appreciate you. There you go. Bringing that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, Mike. I don't want you to uh, romanticize the answer. I don't want you to, um, because it's it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's going to be a tough one on you, and it's difficult not to because we're fans of our era. But let's talk about overall five bars, offense and defense. Who's five bars better, Tony Spruderman or Tom Spear? And after that, who has the best five bar of all time, in your opinion? Wow, that's tough to compare. You know, both mm-hmm. of them uh, reached the pinnacle with their fives. Uh, Tom Spear reached the pinnacle with his five, I'd say 78 from 78 to 80. He dominated the tour. He was the number one five bar. Mm. Uh, looks like Spreederman is now, uh, Todd did a great job teaching Colin Yan his five bar. Uh, you know, you've had, uh, Tony Bacon with, with his mm-hmm. five bar, but, uh, in terms of the far wall, I played behind Tim Burns, and I've never played behind a five bar, uh, especially firewall that, that's that good. Uh, I'll give you an example. In the finals of the of the Eastern World Championships against Wiswell and Furry, the second set, Wiswell starts off the match seven for seven on the five. <laughs> Seven for seven on the three against me. And he's down one game to nothing. Hmm. And how that happened is he went four for four in the first game, but we had the drop and Burns went five for five and went five out of six on Furry. And the the one he missed was a check straight that came right back to him. Hmm. Wow. So, uh, you know, during that time frame, uh, you know, Wiswell was the premier forward on tournament soccer, as evidenced by his record. And uh, the, you know, Spear during that same time period with that Wiswell and Furry were making their mark, he was making his mark. So you had uh, interesting dynamics going on at the time. But uh, Spreederman, uh, that's, a, that's an evolved uh, five bar there. Uh, just because of how he learned to hold it when he was short, uh, when he was a kid, mm-hmm. and he still holds it that way, and he gets that super leverage, and he's practiced it so many times, he can do it at warp speed, which is one of the biggest gripes about Tornado, <laughs> because the men are so hard, it makes it hard to catch, but he catches it. Yeah. And and so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's hard to... It's hard to uh, Compare one era to another, especially like, you know, when you see the the threads on on uh, the computer and you'll see people like uh, Simon, you know, you know, debating people, you know, from the modern era that the tournament soccer players were better than the tornado players. And how do you measure that? Well, I'll tell you how I measure that. The tornado stars, <laughs> you know came from Tornado. I mean, the Tornado Stars came from tournament soccer. Todd Lafredo was a tournament soccer player. Right. Dave Gummison was a tournament soccer player. Tom Spear was a tournament soccer player. So the greats that you're talking about over on Tornado were, you know, what I call rising stars during the tournament soccer era. I love so, how, how I love how diplomatic you are. You should be a politician. You never answered the question. <laughs> Let me make it easy for you, buddy. Let me make it easy for you. You're 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 playing goalie. And you're playing against Lucifer. I'll take Spreederman. I'll take Spreederman on my team. <laughs> oh, no, the, for the five bar, for the pass. Will you take Spreederman for the five bar pass, or will you take Spear? Yeah, I'll take Spreederman. I want the aggressive one. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, fine, I right. want the aggressive pass, not the finesse pass. All right, all right. But, That's good. But That's good. If, if, but if I have to bet, uh, Spear might get the ball first. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Governor. I love it. I love it. So, Mike, it, I think it would be we'd be remiss if we didn't get into the the, the whole topic of uh, Foosballers, the movie. And of course, you got a chance to appear in that film. And I, you know, the first time I saw the movie was in New York City at a, at a screening. There was four hundred people in that audience, and there was not a dry eye in the house when they when they saw you on screen. Yeah. 
So what was that like? Uh, well, that was probably when I was talking about my dad. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, my dad, you know, what a great individual. Here's a rocket engineer genius mm. that I wanted to be just like. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. Really? I wanted to do what he did, work on missiles. I wanted to be uh, a fighter, a fighter pilot. He was on a destroyer. Yeah. And so I wanted to be, I wanted to do everything my dad did. Jeez. And he had a serious talk to me when I was in high school and he goes, look, that's flattering that you want to do what I did. He goes, but I tell you what, I don't think that's the formula for happiness for you. Hmm. And he goes, I have a little bit of money. Why don't you just try to find something that makes you happy? Don't work for a corporation. <laughs> don't go into the military. Wow. And, and do something on your own. Wow, that's, and, a, that's and, amazing. Yes. Amazing. That's an incredible dad. Yeah. yeah. And so little did he know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna be a, you're gonna be a pot smoking hippie playing foosball. I had no idea. Yeah, foosball was going to emerge, and then uh, I dropped out of school to play foosball. I was uh, less than a year from graduating college, mm. and he didn't take that too well either. How how long and, did it take for you to pay his money back, Mike? <laughs> well, within six months, I was the national champion. Wow. That's amazing. And then the following year, I was the world champion. Yeah. And Jeez. when he when he goes to work one day, and he goes, uh, one of his guys came up to him and said, "Hey, I saw your kid in the Rocky Mountain News today. Congratulations!" And it, you know, I know you got to be proud of him. He barely knew I was in the tournament. He knew I was playing, but he didn't know it was the stature that it was. And so he had about ten of his guys say something to him at work. Hey, I saw your kid in the newspaper. That's cool. You know, he's doing good at the tournament, blah, blah. He's the favorite. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it started changing his attitude. And then I got him to invest in one of my game rooms. And and the next thing you know, I was paying him more money than he was making at Lockheed Martin. Cool. Awesome. Didn't go on for a long time, but still for a brief couple, three years there, uh, we did real well with it. And at the 75 Worlds, when they awarded the plaques for the first pro tour they ran the tour and then awarded the plaques at the world championships uh i was the number one money winner man and my dad was the only parent there <laughs> proud it's to amazing. say the least it's lovely uh, I love yeah that. that is so, so cool. he enabled me he enabled me to do what i did and and they thought it was very interesting that all of a sudden here and see they were in the coin industry also they mm -hmm. were in laundromats and car washes and so when i bought 45 foosball tables put them all out on location in three days opened wow. three game rooms 45 and was and was the oh. local foosball distributor my dad was just going see i told you this would work <laughs> 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 that's, a lot. that's amazing. I that's love awesome. That. Wow. wow. So so you're a movie star. So you know, do you get people stop you on the street and say, Hey, I saw you in that movie? Have you have you had that happen yet? Uh I've had a few 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 people do it. And of course I've prompted a few people to it. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> every, everyone everyone liked it. And probably the number one comment I hear is they didn't do enough stuff on the old part. Yes. They didn't do enough on the heyday. Yep. So I would agree with that. <laughs> How could I not agree? With would you do it again? So, sure, sure. Yeah, it uh, it was fun doing it. And uh, as Linga and crew came to my house and interviewed me for like ten hours. Okay. So he's got a lot of tape that's not that's not on yeah, there. Yeah, Joe probably has enough stuff to make another run at another show. He could right. he, he could have made a series out of that to tell you the yeah. truth. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. One thing, one thing I know about Mike Bowers, uh put a microphone in front of him and you're gonna get some stories. And we have <laughs> something here tonight. It's been really a great time, you know, hanging out with you. Hey, and by the way, you know, the ITSF recently announced that there is a new category called 
super seniors. It's for 60s and over. Ooh. Um, and, you know, and then that's true. True story. Yeah. yeah so, you know what? There, there's I, four timeouts. There's four timeouts. You could use the bathroom. Four three times. <laughs> you have to extend it from 30 seconds yeah, but, to um, three, three, yeah, no, three no, hours. Give, give Zeke I've got a call. Depends give for Zeke that. a call. <laughs> <laughs> Great sponsor. Uh, Depends. <laughs> and they have elastic yeah. now, so they just go on like training pants. Dude, yeah, <laughs> so comfortable. Oh, and, man. And, and I told you guys I'm going to be 70 in April, so yeah. 60s. Yeah, you guys are a little too late for me here. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's a, they're yeah. youngsters. They're young, being up on some youngsters. Isn't I was yes, fortunate, I enough, fortunate enough to win uh, two of the dinosaur uh, doubles yeah. events, and uh, those were fam- th- those were fun. I love so, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's still hope. <laughs> well, it's been, as usual, you know, one thing I knew uh, when we booked you for this show is I was going to get to sit back and listen to the good old days, the glory days, to listen to you through your eyes, kind of explain and illuminate what it was like. And you certainly have done that here tonight. And, and Mike, you, you know that, uh, you know what I think of you. And, and I really appreciate how involved you still are with the Hall of Fame ceremonies as they come along. And of course, here tonight, and with with uh, foosballers, et cetera, and we we really appreciate you, and 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 what a great what a great night here at Foos Talk Live. Hey, well, you know, you guys, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, next oh. time we do this, we'll do the Fast Times at Ridgemont High version. Yes, yeah. and uh, it'll be a lot more fun. Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, but if it's, if, if, if it's super stoned, I'm now so oh, that's what that means. just Miles. let me know. Uh, we'll we'll get clay on the case and we'll get the uh, seven second delay all set up. We'll be all set. You there know. you go. Yeah, the and dump we'll bring in PB cakes for a special. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can just go please. full pre-recorded. On that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All so, right, you guys. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate so, you having me. So, Mike, Thank just you, before you go, uh, first of all, with, uh, on behalf of Foos Talk Live, you, the door is always open to you. Uh, you have a you have a gold card here. So anytime you want to come back and just hang out, we're 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 down with that. Okay, well, uh, when you have Mike Bell's on, uh, <laughs> will you definitely invite me back so yes. I can harass him during the whole program? Please do, please All do. Right. <laughs> Play right now, Mike Bell's B-E-L-Z. Let's let's get in touch with Mike and let's let's get him on as well. That would be that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds cool. Thanks again, All you right, guys. Man. All right, Mike. You, have Mike. a great one. Right, bye. Thanks, Talk bye. to you soon. Wow. So yeah, this is uh, this is even better than I expected. This is uh, this is terrific. The the, the great right. Mike Bowers. You are getting such an education, Tom Robinson. I you really am. are. I mean, the, the players we're having on every mm-hmm. week who talk about the good old days, talk about their insights. How about some of those insights he gave us about his yeah. approach, about him right. keeping notes and records of opponents? I mean, high end stuff and really and- interesting for for young players and old players, everyone. Oh, For yeah. those of you listening, and if you're fans of the show and you've listened to me ask that question, you've heard both Ryan Moore and Midori combine. They're, they're separate parts of that approach. He says he has a controlled fury. He has a focused adrenaline. He takes his energy and he focuses it, which is what Ryan does. And you heard Midori say, I'm going to take a look at that thing I know I can execute. What's my money shot? What's my money pass? Mm-hmm. What's my op- what, Maybe what's my option to ensure if they're going to take that away? But Mike, Mike Bauer is saying, look, I know what I can execute, and I'm going to go after that thing, and I'm going to do it with aggression and assertiveness right. and fire. Those are keys to winning, winning keys to the psychology of getting past getting past right. second place. Don't forget it. Big I stuff. love that. Got to be a killer. Love yep, that. Yeah, be a killer a instinct. I love that. That's go, a, go a recurring the theme, go for no the doubt. Yep. And uh, I think that uh, collectively speaking already, we could probably write the book on uh, on philosophy here when it comes to foosball. But, yeah. This is this is a terrific addition. So, Jim, any parting shots on uh, tonight's show? Yeah, no, it was just great hanging out with Mike. And again, you know, I, I get to get to spend some time with him at all these Hall of Fame ceremonies, whether it's Colorado, whether it's Las Vegas or whatever. Um, so it was a lot of fun there. And next week, it's going to be a lot of fun hanging out with Dave Carrington as well yeah. and Tony Bacon the week after that. And and we're going to try to book, book Mike Bell as part, one half of one of the really <laughs> legendary teams of the 70s, Bells and Bednar, um, guys who came out of Minnesota. Um, and so we're going to we're going to try to book him as well coming up because that would be a great interview. Mike, also a, a really good, uh, a good talker. And one thing, you know, with guys like this tonight and with a few other cases, we ask a question. We can sit back and relax because right. they're going to go for a while. And <laughs> yeah, in some cases, love it. Tonight, I think um, that Bowie went for five or six consecutive minutes in, in answering a question. That a was awesome. Awesome. Mark. 
Yeah, no, I got. I want. I want Clay to have a chance. So I'll just say this: it's he's an archive and a library of knowledge and information, and these are the guys that uh, we covet for what they can still deliver as a resource right. to having fun and winning and being competitive and knowing about the game. Clay, please, what do you got while we still have time? I wish there wasn't a two-hour cap right now. Yeah. yeah, right? Seriously. What I think yeah. people don't realize, and I'm going in a different direction than you probably think I am, but uh, the behind-the-scenes chat, the text chat between the four of us, <laughs> is one of my favorite Delete things. that. Delete. delete. <laughs> and it gets deleted every week, so there's no chance that anybody ever sees it. But right now, oh. I would give anything for Mark to just read his last message for his party. <laughs> <laughs> Hell to the no. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. It's now. by far my I favorite just, thing about a being a little bit off. Be for it's just and so for, it's not for even that a complete reason. Sense. It's not even a complete sense. By it's, the, the thing oh, is, no. is for that reason, I wish we didn't have a two hour cap because right now I would talk for at least. 20 minutes but <laughs> i love it i don't have that option because it looks oh, like we got about well, yeah. about 120 seconds left. well, well so clay cruel yeah cruel clay team. as Man, always keeping cruel. us honest I I, you know this is you are the you are the arbiter of our honesty here at Foos talk live some uh, clay to me yes thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> Oh mm -hmm. man, don't mess with the clay. All right. Or as Freddie Mercury said, uh, nothing really matters. Anyone can see. Nothing really matters, comma, to me. It's, it's actually T U M E Y. <laughs> to me. Nice. Most people don't know that. I'm Oof. in a queen song. Nice. Yeah. We're going to have to quote nice. you on that one. My yep. goodness. Nice. Well, our thanks, uh, sincere thanks to Mike Bowers. Uh, what a terrific guy. What a great talker. <laughs> and he's a great representative of this uh, sport. And uh, thanks to you for tuning in. And thanks to our winners tonight when it comes to our, uh, you know, uh, questions of the week. And, uh, of course, we, we're more than happy to send out, uh, Tyler, your T-shirt for Inside Foos TV. We're back again next week. Uh, looking forward to it. This is Foos Talk Live. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Foos Talk Live is a product of Foosball Radio and Inside Foos TV. All rights reserved. Our sincere thanks to 518 Prince, Foosball Clubs USA, Foosballers The Movie, and the United States Table Soccer Organization. Join us next Sunday for another episode of Foos Talk Live. In the meantime, we'll see you Foosin'.